Greetings, salutations, and welcome to this Midday Power Surge special edition of Prophetic Insights, where we analyze current events as they are fulfilling Bible prophecies. And today is Tuesday, November 16th, 2021. I'm your host, Andrew Henriquez. Breaking news, my friends. And as I share this particular news, by God's grace, we want to join the conversation and evangelize. That's our calling, friends, our God-given vocation. We want to turn people from darkness to God's marvelous light, to turn people from sin, transgression, iniquity to God's Bible truth so they can get victory over every sinful thought, every sinful feeling, every sinful word, every sinful action. Here it is, my friends. Virginia professor on the fire after seeing sexual attraction to children isn't always immoral. And who is speaking? Alan Walker. He identifies as queer and non-binary trends. He said this during a recent interview. And before I play this, by the way, he teaches sociology and criminal justice at Old Dominion University. Take a listen. New at 5.30 and Old Dominion University professor is taking a lot of heat. Alan Walker said the word pedophile shouldn't be used to refer to people who are attracted to children because it comes with a stigma. Friends, Alan Walker and others are simply destigmatizing the textbook definition of pedophilia. Take a look at this. That's the dictionary, my friends. A psychosexual disorder characterized by sexual interest. Yes, pedophilia, an ongoing sexual attraction to pre pubertal children, 12 years and younger. Pedophilia, a sexual perversion in which children are the preferred sexual object. It goes on. It's a person who has a sustained sexual orientation toward children. Destigmatizing pedophilia. It goes on to state that Alan Walker said in this interview that these individuals should not bear the name pedophile. We must call them minor attracted people. The acronym MAPS. Listen. In an interview with the Prostasia Foundation, Walker said the term minor attracted people or MAPS should be used to describe people who are attracted to children. It's less stigmatizing than other terms like pedophile. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear the term pedophile, they automatically assume that it means a sex offender. Uh, and that isn't true. And it leads to a lot of misconceptions about attractions toward minors. All right. And then Walker goes on to say that child sexual abuse is an inexcusable crime, end quote. My friends, in other words, it is wrong for the action. But then he goes on to state that it's okay to comfort, to pamper people like these with their sinful sexual desires, feelings, passions, and attractions to children. Brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is, a sinful thought in God's eyes does not necessarily cause God to put on your record that you committed a sin. That's number one. Number two, when sin, the sinful thought, is conceived, held onto, then God records it as a sin in our books of record in heaven. And the Bible confirms this in James chapter 1, verse 14. And verse 15, that man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, when lust is conceived, that's it, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. What death? Not just the first death, but the second death from which there is no return. 
Listen to this. For their part, Walker said, child sexual abuse is an inexcusable crime. The goal of my research is to prevent crime. I embarked on this research in hopes of gaining understanding of a group that previously has not been studied in order to identify ways to protect children. Mm -hmm. So in other words, he's saying the act is wrong, but the thought is not wrong. My friends, take a look at this simple comparison with what we are looking at and the Seventh-day Adventist leadership that published a document which I'll get to very shortly. Look at the first paragraph from this. Take a look. There it is. On the section, Summary of Biblical Teachings on Homosexual Practice, the following was stated. It should be emphasized, however, that the biblical materials condemn homosexual practice, but there is no castigation of innate homosexual orientation per se. That's the point I want you to see, brothers and sisters. At this juncture, it is necessary for me to make a transition for the purpose of a clear juxtaposition. The SDA leadership published the following 21-page document, look at the date, on October 9, 2015. Is that significant? Yes. Just after June 26, 2015, when America legalized same-sex union. All right, the title of that 21-page document, red words underlined, an understanding of the biblical view on homosexual practice and pastoral care. My friends, I want to say this. We are told in God's word that there are degrees of sin. So yes, I just conflated the act, the thought of pedophilia with homosexuality. Some people are going to say, I, I see no connection. But remember, sin is sin. While well, there is a degree, there are degrees in sin. Steps to Christ. Page 30 confirms. God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in his estimation as well as in that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem, in the eyes of men, no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect. But God estimates all things as they really are. Listen, the drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven. While pride, the thought, selfishness, you see what's happening here? And covetousness too often go unrebuked unrebuked so my friends what we are going to see now the sda leadership stated we want to differentiate between homosexual orientation and homosexual practice and what we are going to see from these statements the leadership are actually intimating the very thought is not sinful while people are being told you can never get victory over those sinful thoughts. In other words, you can continue to hold on to those sinful thoughts. Don't cry out to God for victory and receive victory and you will still be saved. Take a look. There it is. In this statement, we differentiate between homosexuality as an orientation and homosexual practice and then they explain the homosexual orientation propensity inclination condition and disposition this is a similar statement to alan walker's statement take a look at this my friends listen alan walker is simply going to say that it is okay it is not immoral for adults to be attracted to minors. As long as they don't act on their feelings. They explained there is a difference between attraction and behavior.
Walker said there was no morality attached to attraction because that's something we can't help. The Prostagia Foundation's executive director, Jeremy Malcolm, agrees. What experts like Dr. Walker are saying is that telling these people that they are inherently bad and doomed to offend is counterproductive. Now, friends, what do you think the drunkard would think? He, he would love to hear these sentiments from wordlings and even church leaders. That's number one. What about the crack addict, the cocaine addict, the marijuana smoker, the tobacco smoker, the heroin addict? Oh, we were born this way and we can continue to hold on to these urges without victory and still be accepted by God. No wonder many professed Christians smoke and take drugs, etc. What would the fornicator think of as he or she hears of these sentiments from not only Alan Walker, but even church leaders? Okay, it's license to hold on to sinful desires. What about children who disobey their parents? <laughs> The liar, those who th steal, the thief, does he make sense? the adulterer, and now Alan Walker and his cohorts went on to say, listen, there's no choice. We were born this way, and because we were born this way, holding on to these sinful thoughts, you are not immoral. The controversy surrounding Old Dominion University professor Dr. Alan Walker centers around their argument that not everyone who is attracted to children will abuse children. It isn't actually a choice. So people are just born with this condition. It's no choice. You're born with this condition. That means don't look for any change. Listen to what the SDA leadership stated in that 21 page document. On one hand, the practice is wrong. However, don't expect a change. Listen to this. It says, others have pled with God to change them and have submitted to therapy with the goal of change, but have not been changed. I'll come back to that. They have accepted their same-sex attraction as their lifelong reality. Brothers and sisters, Others have pled with God to change them, but have not been changed. In other words, the statement is that God accepts them as they are, holding on to their sinful thoughts. Or, simply, God is powerless to change them. That's what that statement implies. Or, blame God. You were born this way. Yes, we were all born with a sinful nature, the sinful propensity to sin. All of us have this. But Psalm 51, David says, yes, I was born in sin. Yes, shapen in iniquity, but thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Yes, read Psalm 51, verse 1 through verse number 12. Now, look at this. It says, this is Alan Walker. We have a tendency to want to categorize people with these attractions as evil or morally corrupt. But when we are talking about non-offending, minor, attracted people, these are people who have an attraction they didn't ask for. So brothers and sisters, what is that implying? You can blame them for their sinful desires. So who are we to blame? Must we blame somebody else? Who are we to blame? Okay, blame God. Is that what this is saying? Brothers and sisters, think about this. In the Garden of Eden, in chapter 3 of Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned and Christ confronted them, who did Adam blame? He blamed God. The woman you gave to me. Adam blamed Eve for his sinful thoughts and sinful actions. Number one. Number two, who did Eve blame? 
Eve blamed the serpent, blamed Satan. By the way, who was the one that created, who made Satan, created, made Satan? It was God. Both Adam and Eve blamed God, blamed somebody else. But in God's eyes, both of them were guilty. While you're tempted, remember James chapter 1, verse 14, verse 15? Man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and entice. When lust is conceived, held on to, it bringeth forth sin. When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Take a look at this, my friends. Notice what this goes on to say. A person is moral or immoral by his actions and not by his thoughts, feelings. This is what Alan Walker stated. Listen, from my perspective, there's no morality or immorality attached to attraction to anyone because no one can control who they are attracted to at all. In other words, it's not who we are attracted to that is either okay or not okay. It's our behaviors in responding to that attraction that are either okay or not okay. Who believed that statement? In other words, holding on to your sinful attraction, sinful feeling, sinful thought, that is not an immoral situation. You are still moral. It's only when you carry out the sinful thoughts, then you are immoral. Who believes that? My friends, in volume five, Testimonies for the Church, Page 310, we're told, if your thoughts are wrong, your feelings will be wrong. And your thoughts and feelings combined make up your moral character. All of us were born with cultivated, hereditary tendencies to sin. I should say hereditary desires for sin. We have all cultivated also sinful desires. But brothers and sisters, can we get victory? Do we see a need to get victory? The desire of ages. Page 671 says, Christ has given his spirit as an overcoming power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and sin and to impress his character upon his church. John chapter 14 and verse 30, as Christians, listen up. When Christ came to the closing scene of his earthly ministry, his characteristic must be ours, secondary sins. What did Christ say in John 14, 30? He says, the prince of this world cometh and has found nothing in me. Look at this statement now in Great Controversy, page 623. We are told not even by a thought could Christ sin. Brothers and sisters, this must also be my experience, be your experience. Not only for pedophiles, drunkards, LGBTQ+, all the way down the, the alphabet, and the drug addicts the pharmaceutical drug addicts, the rapists, those who are covetous. It goes for everyone, those who malice people, the unforgiving heart. We must get victory over sinful thoughts and actions. Do we see our need? Listen, there it is, my friends. Watch carefully. Now while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Read all of this, my friends, please. John 14, 30 is referenced in blue. Last sentence, my friends. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Now, 
Here is a biblical principle. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's the act, right? Listen to this now. Verse 28 onward, Christ now says, But I say unto you, I say unto you, if you look at a woman and lust after that woman in your heart, you have committed adultery already in your heart. So based on the Bible, when you lust and hold on to that lust, the sin is already committed before you commit the very act. So what must we do with the words of Alan Walker and his allies? Discard them. What about the SDA leadership statement? Those belong in a trash can. They are abominable, blasphemous against God's word. Now, in verse 30, Christ goes on to say, If your right eye offend you, pluck it out. What is that? What you see, then you desire. Make sense? Then Christ says, If your right hand offend thee, chop it off. The hand, it's your works. What is Christ teaching? Sin begins with the thought that is conceived and not surrendered. And sin is also seen with the action. It's both. But these men are teaching us, in summary, as long as you don't carry out the act, you are still moral. You can hold on to sinful thoughts, sinful feelings and attractions, and you can still consider yourself moral. Moral? A Christian? My friends, we are told how we can get victory over sin. The desire of ages... Page 123 says, the same principle, the prince of this world cometh, said Jesus, and hath nothing in me. Red words, Christ did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought did Christ yield to temptation. So it may be with us. How, friends, how? It says, next paragraph. There it is. Spending time in God's word. That's it. Spending time in God's word. Come back here. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 gives us the formula of victory. It says, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Matthew 17, the, the father with his son, in the fire, in the water, in the fire, in the water, demon possessed, in the fire, in the water. Today I choose to do good, tomorrow, next moment, I'm doing that which is evil. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body, the thoughts of this death, who shall bring deliverance? Christ will bring deliverance. Amen, friends. Christ will bring deliverance. And what did Christ say? How be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. There are some sins we can get victory over. The sinful thoughts, words, and actions. The others are so ingrained. Hereditary sins. Cultivate. You have learned those sins. Been in them for years. Yes, brothers and sisters. How can we get victory now? Some things goeth not out, but by what? Prayer and fasting. I yield right there. Yield not to temptation. Why? For yielding is sin, the songwriter says. 